that would match for everybody so that she could be here, and she was terribly disappointed because she is really the person who makes all of this possible here in this house. And so if you like it and you think it's pretty, you can thank <laughs> the First Lady. There is someone here that you should meet that you won't have a chance to meet otherwise. <laughs> However, Ms., uh, the First Lady and I took a little poll upstairs, and we decided there was definitely one person you wanted to hear from today, and it wasn't us. <laughs> and uh, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you your host for the luncheon this afternoon, the President of the United States. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. No, oh, please. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the White House. And it's good to see so many old friends and Westerners to boot and to uh, have the opportunity to make new ones. Friends, that is, not Westerners. Uh, 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 and, uh, of course, I have been introduced by one of my two favorite women, and she's explained to you why there's only one of them here. You've all heard that politics make strange bedfellows. Well, I found out they kind of works in reverse also. <laughs> so she's in Houston and I'm in Washington. But I want to thank all of you for what you're doing to advance the ideals and the goals that unite us. We've journeyed far, I think, in these three years but it never would have happened without the drive and the energy and determination of office holders in state capitals and communities all across America. America's future looks bright and you've made the difference. Our economic recovery is bringing new hope and opportunity to our people. Inflation has plummeted by two thirds to about 4%. The prime rate is almost half what it was when we took office. Three words describe our recovery program, jobs, jobs and jobs. And last month alone, 700,000 more Americans were found on the payrolls. And we've had the steepest drop in the unemployment rate in over three decades. And I meant the 700,000 in just that one month from the previous month. The overall unemployment rate is down to 7.7%. And among adult women, the rate has dropped from 9.1% to 6.9. Since the beginning of the dramatic upturn 15 months ago, nearly 5 million, 4.9 million people have gone back to work in the United States. And more people are working than ever before in our history. But we can't rest until every American who wants a job has found one. All the leading economic indicators suggest that our economic growth will continue. The failed policies of higher taxes, bigger government, soaring inflation, and runaway spending haven't disappeared. In fact, they're lurking not far away, as anyone who had time to watch the debate last night would know. Right now, those failed policies are on the stump, just a few hundred miles south of here. The federal government and the budget must be brought under better control. Deficits remain a problem, but the biggest problem is the size of the government's claim on our economy. I'm dead serious about negotiating a down payment on the deficit, but common sense, not partisan politics, should govern the deliberations so that we can protect the interests of the American people. The starting point is to cut out the waste in spending, and believe me, we've discovered there's still a lot of waste in spending. Personal tax rates have been reduced. We passed an historic tax reform indexing so that government will no longer be able to use inflation to profit at your expense. But those in government who have a stake in bigger government don't want you to have indexing. The billions in tax and spending increases that these spenders are pushing would not reduce the deficit, they just reduce the recovery. We want to go forward, not backward. And America will go forward if we simplify the tax system and reduce tax rates further. Republicans want to build an opportunity society. We can all be proud that we're putting America's future back in the hands of the people and proud that we're working to strengthen our social institutions, the bedrock of our society and our freedom. But important challenges remain. 
we can start by letting our children have the right to call on a little help from God at the start of the school day, if they so choose. When 80% of the people want voluntary prayer back in our schools, I think it takes a lot of gall to tell them they can't have it. Well, if enough of you make your voices heard, we can restore the right of voluntary prayer in the classroom. Education is another idea or another area where we're the ones with the courage to call for basic reform. Excellence in education means getting back to fundamentals, working from the bottom up, providing local leadership and thinking smarter. And I think our support for basic reform is starting to pay off. When our administration took office, only a handful of states had task forces on education. Today, they all do. And reforms are being adopted in academic standards, discipline, curriculum, and basic values. For example, 44 states are increasing graduation requirements. 42 are studying improvements in teacher certification. And 33 are considering or have enacted legislation for master teacher type programs. So it's up to us to make the sure the momentum continues. In connection with this whole thing in education, I just had a chore this morning that was most pleasant. You know this partnership thing that is sweeping the nation of various business firms or organizations or groups and labor unions and even some of our professional athletic teams have formed partnerships with local schools and they help. They're going to field trips and going there, lecture, whatever they can do to help. Well, the White House adopted a school here in town. Congress Heights School, and I was out there this morning and was taking questions from uh, the students there and meeting them. The most humbling experience was in the kindergarten. <laughs> the kindergarten computer class. I don't know the first thing about those things, but those five-year-olds did. There they all sat in front of their computers. Finally, the one I was sitting beside said, well, go ahead and push the button. I was scared to death. <laughs> but a third important challenge is to restore the proper balance to our criminal justice system. We came to Washington determined to crack down on habitual criminals, organized crime, and the drug pushers. And in 1982, crime went down 4.3%, and that's the biggest decline in 10 years. But too many law-abiding citizens are still being harmed or killed while dangerous criminals get off scot-free. The long overdue reform that we need must begin with passage of our Comprehensive Crime Control Act, the most important anti-crime legislation that's been introduced in more than a decade. It was approved by the Senate last month. You can imagine why and who has the majority there. But now the bill is being bottled up in committee by Democrats in the House. And I'm very disappointed in their attitude. When it comes to putting criminals behind bars, when it comes to keeping the American people safe, there should be no Republicans or Democrats, just Americans. Now, if they continue to refuse, then you and I not only have the right, we have the obligation to hold their feet to the fire. And just as we're strengthening the basic values which made America great, there's a new sense of purpose and direction to America's foreign policy. 37 years ago today, President Truman addressed the American people before a joint session of the Congress. In the closing of that speech, which later would be known as the Truman Doctrine, he said, the free peoples of the world look to us for support in maintaining their freedoms. If we falter in our leadership, we may endanger the peace of the world, and we shall surely endanger the welfare of this nation. Well, back in the late 70s, some had lost sight of Mr. Truman's wisdom. We had an uncomfortable feeling that we lost respect overseas and we no longer trusted our leaders to defend peace and freedom. And today, the world knows once more that America can be counted on to defend freedom, peace, and human dignity. And believe me, that makes the world safer for all of us. Now, let me say a few words about El Salvador, a new democracy that is struggling to protect itself from extremists of the right and the left. El Salvador will be holding elections at the end of the, this month. But if they're to succeed, they must take place in a climate of security. We know that Cuban-supported guerrillas plan to disrupt these elections, just as they tried and failed to do that two years ago when they held their first elections. 
But the Salvadorans are out of U.S. military aid assistance funds because my original request was not fully funded by the Congress. El Salvador, their army trying to protect them against these guerrillas will soon be out of ammunition, supplies, and funds for U.S. training support. As a matter of fact, shipments of medical supplies have already had to be stopped. Without these supplies and training support, El Salvador cannot hold secure elections or defend their country. Therefore, I've asked the Congress to approve an emergency short-term military assistance package to tide the situation over until the Congress acts on the recommendations of the Bipartisan Commission on Central America. This package is early, urgently needed, and I urge its rapid approval by the Congress. Democracy in El Salvador depends on it. And to those who maybe question whether they really are achieving anything in democracy, two years ago, observers from our Congress went down to observe those elections. 83% of the people turned out. We haven't turned out 83% of the people for an election in years and years. And they actually saw some of these congressmen and talked with a woman who was standing in the lines for hours waiting to vote, waiting her turn, had been shot, wounded by the guerrillas, and refused to leave the lines for medical attention until she had been allowed to vote. This is what we're trying to defend down there and protect. And I think they deserve our help after 400 years. Two months ago, that bipartisan commission submitted its report. They called on our government to substantially increase economic and military assistance to Central America. Between two-thirds and three-fourths of that assistance will be economic and social, not military. And although the region is vital to our national interest and the situation increasingly urgent, the Congress has not acted. As a nation, we can't afford to let this issue dry, drag on while people die in Central America. We can't afford to let political partisanship jeopardize our security interests or undercut the opportunity for El Salvador to build its democracy. The Bipartisan Commission gave us a formula which should be acceptable to all. So let's use it and get on with it. When historians write about these years, they'll find that very skilled and talented women played a key role in putting America back on her feet. And here in Washington, we're calling on the talents of women and the leadership of women in a big way. For the first time in history, three women are on the cabinet at the same time. UN Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick, Secretary of Health and Human Services Margaret Heckler, Secretary of Transportation Elizabeth Dole, Ambassador Faith Whittlesey has brought her talent and skill to the White House staff, and all told more than 1,400 women hold policy-making posts in our administration and a number of them are here in the room today with you. We couldn't get all 1,400 in, but several others that are in here. And I won't try to name uh, all of them, but I can just tell you, believe me, they are serving and we are dependent on them. And I say that with one, my own girl Friday is sitting over there, Kathy Osborne. And, uh, She keeps me on track. <laughs> well, one of my proudest days was when Sandra Day O'Connor became the first woman justice in the history of the Supreme Court. Now, that's, the, that's the tradition of the grand old party. Even before women, maybe you don't know this, had a right to vote our party became the first party to elect a woman to the United States Congress. And today, the only women in the Senate are Nancy Kassebaum and Paula Hawkins, Republicans. And of course, we have nine outstanding Republican Congresswomen, including Barbara Vukanovic, who is here with us today. Now, don't you think it's about time that we give them some more company? But just as important, thousands of able Republican women like you are serving in public offices all across America. We want to see the numbers grow. We want to see, see them grow here in Washington for sure, and here in Washington and in every American community. 
Someday, and I hope it's sooner rather than later, a woman's going to have my job. Our job is to make sure she's a Republican. <laughs> We have good reason to approach this election year in high spirits. We can be confident that the American people share our values, but we cannot afford to rest. There's too much that remains to be done. So with your help, with your frontier spirit, we'll get the job done, and we'll make 1984 a great year for the Republican Party. I thank you all for being here, and God bless you all. And now the words you've been waiting to hear, let's have dessert. <laughs> Uh, there is one rule that prevails here. Go on with your dessert and go on eating. You can talk with your mouth full from here on. But we thought there might be a few questions. I know that you've had extensive briefings and yes? <laughs> All right. There is right away. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate that. Thank you. Well, we're we're exploring that. We I couldn't give you a uh, a definite answer on that. Vice President, George has had an opportunity to meet with him and was impressed by some of the things that uh, Chenenko said. Uh, he and I have exchanged messages, and uh, we are very seriously exploring it because we believe that the peace of the world rests between the two superpowers, and uh, we know they're never going to like our system and we're never going to like theirs, but we're in the same world together and we think we ought to be able to find a way to get along. I'm <laughs> Jane Hemp from the Nevada Assembly, and I too want to thank you for inviting us here. I think it's an absolutely great idea to have uh, elected Republicans in here. We can go back to our states and spread the good word about your uh, administration policies. Uh, and it can help, but, uh, help us. In our re-election, my question was, how can we help you in your re-election? Well, you, you are helping, but we've been talking over here at our own, my own table about, and it's up to us to see that you get uh, all the information that is needed. But I'm a great believer in word of mouth advertising. Uh, it used to sell pictures. <laughs> um, and that is the, some of the best kept secrets uh, are in the country today are some of the things that we've been doing here and some of the things we've accomplished. And we need everyone out there spreading the word uh, as to what it is that what we have done. And uh, that would be the biggest help that we could have. Now, I'd... Mr. President, I'm Virginia Isbell from Hawaii. And I would like to know whether your administration feels that the greenhouse effect is real or not real. And if it is real, should that not become our first priority? I, I wish I could give you a definite answer on that. I can only tell you that uh, the, this whole idea of uh, in the environment and the, the greenhouse effect and all, the acid rain situation, we're continuing to study because uh, we don't believe that anyone uh, has the final answer on those things as yet. And before we suddenly plunge into uh, some great programs based on uh, the findings of one group, we want to make sure that uh, we're going in the right direction and that uh, it does warrant uh, that action. The hardest one was with the acid rain on that because it seems so evident and yet the cures are going to be so drastic that we want to make absolutely sure that 
we will find there as a result uh, if we go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Andy Reinhold for the state of Iowa. And of course, we're very grateful for all that you do for America. You're strong in our state. We got you uh, in last time. We're going to do that this time. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a firm believer in the statement that you always say I'm better off now than you were some time ago. And in our state, where we are a highly agricultural state, we need just a little bit more from you as far as we're a little bit late, perhaps in the recovery area in agriculture. Uh, what are some of the things that we could bring out on the positive side? Well, for one thing, there's no question, but agriculture is slower coming back than many other businesses and, and industries. First of all, they were the hardest hit by the cost price squeeze. Uh, the increased cost of production and would have no relationship to the, to the crop prices. With the PIC program, we did get rid of some of that surplus, which automatically brought up an increase in the prices. Um, we are working as hard as we can on trying to restore overseas markets because the, a good per, per percentage of our farm produce now is, is for export. The customers abroad have been hit by the same recession that we were hit with. They're beginning to come back, but not as swiftly as we have. But as they do, they'll be better able to buy. And uh, the height of the dollar in relation to their own currency has been another thing that militated against us. But we... Uh, we're very much on top of that, and I wish Jack Block were here. I'd call on, <laughs> on him. But uh, we, our understanding of that problem, and we're going to be as helpful as we can. And I think there are, well, for one thing, there's been a 30% drop in the cost of production for the farmer now. So with the handle on inflation, this is, this is bound to benefit us. I think I better, let me come back. I better. I look like I've been favoring this side of the <laughs> side of the room. Mr. President, I'd like to ask that you share with the rest of this, uh, the ladies in this room, hi, and gentlemen, the um, story that you shared some time ago with me about the I can philosophy. About the what? That's the way it comes out. I can. <laughs> yes. Um, and it is. I listened to the debate last night, and uh, uh, I didn't hear anything that matches what we are able to say and what we are saying. And it is that. It's more than just these last few years. If we go back, what we have to look at is all the great problems of this country, the distortion of the balance between the levels of government. All of this has come about over a period of a half a century. And when the war was over, since then, there's only been one two-year period when, well, three years now of one house of the Congress that we control. But other than that, there's only been one two-year period out of some 45 years in which the Republicans had control of both houses of the Congress. And for about 45 years, the Democrats have been in complete charge. They have controlled all the taxing policies. They've controlled all the spending programs, all of the things that they're now complaining about. And during all that time, they practiced deliberate deficit spending, which they insisted was necessary to maintain prosperity. Now suddenly, the deficits are supposed to be ours, and we're responsible for them. And I told the ladies at our table here earlier, speaking of things that you can say, if we had stuck with the projected deficits of the previous administration, I mean the budgets of the previous administration, the deficit today would be $191 billion bigger than it is. So, yes. Mr. President, Joanne Wood from Idaho. Uh, we have, have helped you by sending you four, two senators and two representatives to help you cut the deficit. They've been trying. In the, now we'd like to know, as, a, as state officials, what we might do to help you. Well, we will, we're hopeful that very shortly, we, with our Republicans in the Congress and uh, with the Senate leadership, where we have the majority, will be coming forth 
with a program of, that will include some tax reforms and loophole closings, but will also include domestic spending cuts and even some changes with regard to defense, and that we will be able to present a sizable down payment on the next uh, couple of years' uh, deficits. And then at the same time, we realize that once past this election year, when the Congress can settle down to business, we have to look at many important areas of government for, for structural reforms that must take place, or we will go right back into the pattern that we've known for these last 50 years. But we're going to, we're going to do that. Half of the deficit has been structural, caused just by built-in increases that they don't have to pass every year. There they are. And the other half was the recession. Now that half has been going down drastically as people go back to, uh, back to work. Uh, for 15 months, we have been adding 300,000, average of 300,000 people a month uh, to the employment rolls, which we think is a pretty sizable recovery. Thank you, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, and you want, and you want equality. <laughs> <laughs> well, since she was on her feet, could I take that one? <laughs> Mr. President, I'm Harriet Weeder from Reagan Country, Orange County, California. I'm chairman of the Board of Supervisors there. Inasmuch as the media, as we were told this morning, and as, which was not new to many of us, that they've been hell-bent, if you will, to destroy always the presidency, the office of the presidency, which we all agree is totally un-American. Do you have any suggestions as to what those of us politic politicos out there in the hinterlands can do to turn that around? You're talking about the media, turning... Uh, uh, I don't honestly know. You know that we keep being told that somebody that buys newspaper pulp by the ton, we shouldn't get into an argument with, with them. But there is no question but that a lot of, well, I, I told and I'll tell it, I told it on the air so I can tell it to you. I told it in my radio program Saturday. There was a survey that was printed in the Wall Street Journal that was taken with regard to the economic news. And that in the last six months of 1983, there were 104 releases made, stories made, of the improvement in the various indicators as to inflation coming down, unemployment going down, uh, personal income going up, uh, productivity going up, and all of this. 104 of them. 95% of all of such stories, economic stories, were positive on the upbeat. The way they were played on the three national network news uh, station or news programs, 86% of them were portrayed negative. They would give the positive figure and immediately switch to something saying the opposite. And the last one just happened the other day when unemployment went down to 7.7% from the previous month. And that came on the air, 7.7%, a drop in unemployment, almost back to where it was when we started. And uh, immediately switched to a map of the United States with all the states and then said, but, and then started showing the states where there were pockets of poverty and where unemployment was not down to 7.1 but was still higher. And it was typical of what's been going on uh, all through this, this recovery. I don't know whether leaning on them or asking or calling their, I know this, letters to the editor, they aren't a bad idea. They're, they're read more than the editorials are read. And uh, I've often thought that, and I've often thought if we could get our friends on some of the talk shows, whether they're local or national, on the talk shows, let's us be the ones that call in uh, with the right questions. Thank you. So now, I know. <laughs> I've never tried to find out what it is if I wait for the third notice. <laughs> We are going to meet all of you in the other room. George and I will be...